Not recording yet. Yeah, I'm just going to start now. I'd like to welcome everyone to Denby Dale's regular online meeting this evening. Uh, really pleased that we've got Heather M0HMO from Shropshire, uh, who's going to give us a talk about uh, high altitude balloons. So uh, really looking forward to, uh, I think, what will be an interesting introduction from Heather. Uh, we'll do as we normally do. We'll let Heather speak and do her presentation, and then we'll open up to a general discussion. So without further ado, Heather, I'm going to hand over to you. And by all means, uh, just say a few more words about yourself before you start, because I'm sure people would like to know. OK, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for inviting me. It's, uh, it's sort of a bit of an honour. It's become this, uh, this icon of uh, things to talk on, the, the Denby Dale Club, uh, where we hear about it. So, uh, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. First thing, um, I can't share my screen because um, it tells me that the uh, host has disabled participant sheen screen sharing. You can do it now, Heather, so. <laughs> you, you can do it now. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, if that... Did that work? Yep. Brilliant. Okay. Um, so, as we said, my name's Heather Lomond. Um, retired about ooh, six years ago now. Um, got interested in amateur radio about 10 years ago. Um, did the exams and then retired and uh, haven't looked back. I've never been as busy as I am right now doing amateur radio things. Um, got interested in all sorts of bits of amateur radio, including what we're going to talk about now. Um, we uh, um, came about this project through the Linux users group. I used to do a lot of Linux in my professional life. And um, so uh, the Linux users group, which uh, has the somewhat unfortunate title of the Shropshire Linux users group of an acronym of SLUG. Um, so uh, yeah, we came, we came up with this idea of doing uh, a high altitude balloon project. And um, so we did that um, when I came along they really had the idea, but they hadn't done anything. Um, I love the idea. I thought this idea of getting up uh, on the edge of the atmosphere was, was a really cool thing to do. So, um, yeah, so that's why I got into this. And uh, obviously the amateur radio plays a big part, although as we'll see, there is very little amateur radio in this presentation. Um, the reason for that is, as you're probably aware, um, there's uh, no amateur radio allowed airborne and high altitude balloons by definition can't therefore use the, uh, the airborne uh, uh, frequencies other than the ISM band, uh, which is uh, the only thing that we, we as amateurs are allowed to fly in, in the air. So uh, there is amateur radio in terms of we use two meter talkback for when we were chasing after this balloon. Uh, but the rest of this is a lot about radio and not an awful lot about amateur radio, but hopefully we'll entertain you anyway. So um, I'm just going to whiz through a few things. We call this project the Sheep Warrior, will come evident later. And uh, we didn't want to just stop with just putting up a balloon, so we developed a whole load of other things involved uh, with the tracking of these balloons to try and get them to uh, land. Well, we, we can't control where they land, but we can go and find them when they have landed if we can get the telemetry to uh, tell us where they are. So that's just a brief bit. We'll show a few pictures of what we, uh, what we got from the balloon and we'll show um, some of the data that we collected from it. So uh, that's an overview. Sheet Warrior is the actual balloon itself. Uh, basically what we've got here is a large latex balloon with a payload with a transmitter on it underneath. Heather, can uh, I, can I just stop? A parachute on. Heather, can I just yeah. stop you for a second? Do you think you're sharing anything on the screen other than your desktop? Because at the moment, all we can see is your desktop icons. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Uh, hold on a second. I shall do that. And then... <laughs> the best, yeah. the best thing to do is to start the application that you're sharing the information from, and yep. 
when you've got that running on your screen, then hit share screen and you'll see that option will be on there to actually share the application that's running the, uh, that's it. That's it. It's working. Yep. It's working now. Okay. So, um, okay. I'll just whiz through what I did before. That was the title. That was <laughs> the, uh, sorry about this. Um, what about the way of radio, a brief overview, and there we are with the overview of what's going on. So, um, yeah, then uh, we created this idea of the sheep warrior is uh, the actual balloon. So obviously, if you're going to chase after it, you need to have a sheep dog. And um, there's our car, I wish. Um, and basically, we put an antenna on the car and we ran around on, on the ground chasing after this thing. And then we created a thing which we called the sheepdog puppy, which is a little tripod based tracker, which is a sort of cross between a, um, a GPS locator and a direction finding antenna. And we can use that to actually point us the last bit. And finally, we had the, a concern about how you actually would find it if it had crash landed somewhere where you didn't have a good radio link to it. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, but we called this thing the Shepherd, just to give it a different name. Why did we want to do this? Well, lots of good alt uh, altitude, 25 kilometers. This is a bit of an eye test, but it's basically showing the atmospheric pressure. So you, you're really down at pretty low pressures compared to uh, where you start at ground level up here. Um, one myth that you have to dispel here is that you don't get pictures of the curve of the earth. People seem to think you do, but that's always due to camera aberrations because lenses on these cameras aren't very good and they make things look curved when they're not. Um, but we did want to do some science and really the main reason for doing it is it's quite a fun thing to do. And so we're doing it because we can. So a little bit about Sheet Warrior. It's based on a Raspberry Pi Model B programmed in Linux. It's got a GPS uh, tracking board from a company called Pie in the Sky Pits. Uh, it's got two radios on it. We'll talk a bit about them in a minute. A load of custom sensors. Some thermal insulation, because as we'll talk about, it's going to be very cold up there. Lots of custom software, this big balloon, a parachute to make it come down gently. And it's all built into a pot bottle. And there it is. This is two big pop bottles. Uh, we heat stretched them, fitted them together so that we could uh, have it open it up. Otherwise, we've got a ship in a bottle problem. We've got a label there to tell tell people how to get in touch with me if uh, if they find it. There's the uh, Raspberry Pi and the sensors, and here's the camera. And this little thing is a thermocouple uh, sensor on the outside. We used uh, a slightly novel technique here to keep the thing warm. We've got little uh, polystyrene quavers at the bottom here and some polystyrene that we actually wrapped around the whole thing when we flew it. But the main heating mechanism for this is insulation, where the uh, sun comes through the bottle and just like it does if it comes into your car windows, it heats up on the, the stuff on the inside and the heat can't get out again. And that actually worked really well, as hopefully we'll show you later. Um, other little things, we uh, obviously we've got a choice of things, helium or hydrogen. We chose helium just because it's safer. Um, fairly large balloon. Uh, we'll, we'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, and uh, we'll see, as you see, it starts off at one meter in diameter. And uh, when it goes pop at 25 kilometers up, it's going to be about 10 meters across. So. Uh, it really gets a lot bigger. Um, this isn't uh, a party balloon. This is uh, a serious size of balloon when it gets up there. Uh, it's going to get cold, so we're using lithium batteries and um, lots of nylon cord to connect everything together. And then the uh, sort of schematic here, uh, we've got low bar radio, um, a RITI FSK radio, loads of sensors, batteries, all sorts of things. So that's the balloon. Unfortunately, I have a latex allergy, so I can't touch the thing, but other people did. 
and uh, basically the calculations that you need to do are quite complicated involving the weighing the thing working out the ascent rates and descent rates and the amount of helium and the lift you're going to get but luckily there's a lot of things online so if anybody wants to do this do a do a chase up online for uh, ascent rates of high altitude balloons and you'll find some calculators that will help you out you need to fill it so we uh, we built this little thing with some rubber going through a tube and uh, we cable tie this onto the balloon itself um, and one thing we need to do is we need to get the amount of lift right what they call the neck lift um, and so you, you the way we do that is we fill this bottle with uh, water so that when the bottle just lifts off the ground we know that we've, we've got it lifting just the right amount of weight we can then disconnect this connect this uh, filler here from the balloon tie on the actual payload and let go that's the balloon gas we used uh, just standard BOC balloon gas and there it is with my friend Ian holding the balloon just before it went up and uh, okay a little bit more about the hardware we've got a big Raspberry Pi uh, camera on there that was what I wanted to do get the pictures from the edge of space various sensors uh, pressure temperatures lights all the GPS of course um, we we're going to transmit this all back while the balloon is flying so we want to also keep an eye on the current and the battery voltage so that we know everything's okay and of course the radios two radios one is an FSK running in the ISM band it's running low frequency 50 board gritty with a uh, 10 milliwatt transmitter that's the legal maximum that you're allowed on the ISM band in CW we've also got a low well long range uh, transmitter this is a proprietary space spectrum device but we've got it on there as a backup again maximum of 10 milliwatts and uh, what you see at the bottom here is an example of the information that we transmit on the RITI or the LoRa. so we've got our call sign uh, obviously it doesn't have to be an amateur radio call sign so we've just called it slug after the limits users group then the time latitude and longitude altitude and then a few things uh, temperature pressure that sort of thing and this last thing is the atmospheric pressure 99660 before a checksum the uh, software most of it was written by this guy Dave Ackerman who's sort of the, the god of high altitude balloons in the UK but we uh, we started with that and we added an awful lot of custom code um, there's drivers for all those sensors you saw before custom code for the LoRa module custom code for the camera uh, driver and so on so there's a fair bit there's quite a few thousand hours of work went into this uh, uh, custom software on the actual device so I mentioned this guy Shepard what we were what we were worried about was when the balloon lands if we don't have line of sight then um, we might not be able to receive its radio so what we thought we'd do was we'd have a backup balloon which would be on a tether we'd put that up to the maximum allowable which is about 60 uh, feet uh, 25 meters I think um, and um, the, uh, this would have on it a radio receiver which would convert the, the data that we just looked at into a Wi-Fi signal and then we could sit below it and hopefully it would have line of sight to the uh, to the crashed balloon and it would re relay the radio back down to us on uh, on Wi-Fi and so to do that we had to build our own bit of hardware which is uh, the green bit here uh, this is a Wi-Fi module an ESP chip for those who are familiar with that this is the 432 sensor 434 uh, antenna this is a low bar module and we basically wrote a load of code that sits on here on the, the Wi-Fi module reads the sensor and uh, transmits it down on Wi-Fi uh, I've already mentioned this. We program it through the Arduino IDE, just if anyone's interested in that. And uh, 
we did the circuit designs in Eagle CAD at the time, and we've now moved over to uh, doing everything in Kai CAD. So that's an example of the web page that it generates. As you can see, it's received messages, and it's doing a little bit of sucking out of the data, telling you that uh, it was at this latitude and longitude. And there are various other things that we, we programmed in there. So you can calibrate the thing, uh, you can interrogate it, you can send messages to it, and uh, we used all that for testing and test purposes set up and also getting an idea of the range of this thing. So then uh, we defined these things called the sheepdogs. So the sheepdog mother, which was that car that we looked at, um, basically I've got my Yaesu 857 in, mounted in the car with a super gainer vertical on the roof. Um, we linked to the Wi-Fi for the thing we just looked at, the Shepherd through Android running a hotspot. We had a backup antenna, which we'll look at in a minute, which is just a small handheld 77 antenna. We ran Windows 10 and a version of FLDG, which you're probably familiar with for the digital modes. This is a version called DLFLDG, specially designed for doing high altitude balloon stuff. So that's what DLFLDG looks like. You can see here it's received the RITI, which is what's coming down in this uh, waterfall here. These are the messages we received. When it receives a message that it seems to like, then the, the checksum is consistent with what it expects. It will send this to a central repository called the Hab Hub, um, where the servers will then display that information on a website that anyone can go and look at. So you can actually track this thing real time, um, even if you haven't got a radio, as long as someone receives these messages, then they get bounced up to this website and uh, you can see them. So this is the Hab Hub, tracker.habhub.org. This is the path that the balloon had taken. This is where we launched it in Shropshire. This is round about where it was when obviously we received it. You can see the data that it received. So someone received these messages and passed them to the Hab Hub. And also you can see there were some people over here who were tracking us. Um, and there is actually an eye test here. There's a list of people, including a few people in France. So although the balloon wasn't, uh, was quite a long way away from them, I don't know what that is, 150 miles away maybe, they were still getting it, 10 milliwatts line of sight. So uh, just shows what you can do with very low power, even at 70 sems. So anyway, we've, we raced along after this. There's my car again. Uh, it tells you how it is. And uh, one thing you need is you need to get CAA authorization to run these things. So uh, that's our CAA authority for that flight or one of the flights. Uh, we also created a little um, smaller receiver based on one of these DVB dongles. Again, uh, we had it running the Android as a hotspot with a homebrew antenna, uh, the SDR Sharp program, and the rest of the uh, well, virtual audio cable, which I guess you're familiar with, and the uh, FLDG for the, the decoding again. And that worked fine, and one of our uh, other chase cars was using that very successfully. There's a picture of what the LoRAR and the SDR Sharp look like. The, uh, obviously, the RITI on the left here. And the low R sped spectrum just comes in bursts and you can see a lovely square uh, spectrum there. So it really is doing quite a solid job of uh, passing information. Um, other software we had, GPS loggers that uh, I wrote for the car. And um, we had a, a mechanism of taking that live data, putting it on websites and displaying another version of the, the position plotting on our own live websites in case the uh, the Hab Hub thing wasn't working. A uh, little bits of hardware, I put a GPS sensor and a USB sensor into a box to cart that around in the windscreen to uh, know where the car was. And a little uh, um, 12 volt to a USB power to power all these uh, Android things that we were running. So finally, we talk about the Sheepdog Puppy. Um, this is based on an, an, uh, an Android tablet. Some sensors to tell it where the uh, 
antenna is itself and this is a accelerometer and a, a uh, magnetometer so those two we can tell where our antenna is pointing and we can also tell um what sorry the, we can tell the compass the magnetometer and we can also tell the elevation where it's pointing in the sky this is a low R module which was on the Raspberry Pi that's based on this uh, on this uh, sheepdog puppy and the combination of all of this means that we can have an antenna we can run and display on the uh, tablet where the antenna is pointing as in compass bearing and, and elevation and we can also receive information from the balloon via this uh, sensor which will tell us where the balloon is and therefore where to point everything to get a better reception and once it's crash landed it's on the ground the direction we need to walk in order to find it we uh, we did some fairly clever things we, we used tcip over the wi-fi on the raspberry pi for the tablet so that the pi could know what its uh, gps coordinates were so we could tell where it was after we worked out its direction and uh, elevation we wrote a load of uh, software to run on VN, under um, VNC on the uh, Pi display on the screen. Lots of custom code and lots of low bar code. And uh, a lot of interfaces. Um, this, uh, we wrote a NMEA, which is the GPS locator parser for that. Um, interfaces through HTTP to that low bar module. And we also added in a TCP socket to the Shepherd, which is the thing doing the, um, uh, the Wi-Fi, so that we could get the location from the balloon either direct from the LoRa or from the, uh, the Shepherd module uh, over the Wi-Fi. And that's what it displayed. Um, I called this one my Aliens versus Sheep Warriors. Um, any of you familiar with the film Aliens? They have a nice little tracker that tells them where everything is. And I thought that was quite a neat little idea. So the blue spots are the angle, compass angle, and the elevation of the balloon itself. And the crosshairs are where you're actually pointing your antenna. So as you can see, the antenna is pointing roughly at the right height. It needs to go up a little bit, but it's gone green to tell you're in the right, roughly the right direction. But we're um, I don't know about 80 degrees off in direction so we would need to turn ourselves around until till these two lined up and then the antenna will actually be pointing at the uh, balloon it's getting the uh, latitude and longitude from in this case GPS you can see it's gone green but it can also get it from the low row if it was receiving that um, and it would then uh, be able to tell what it was doing and the ESP chip that we looked at on Shepard is giving us a bit more information about battery voltage and uh, internal temperature. So uh, that was our our sort of semi-mobile tracker when we weren't in uh, All this information came down. We obviously needed to parse it to get all the data out. So we wrote a load of bits of software that will allow us to do access to that sort of thing. And once we wanted to put all the paths on the um, on the website um, this could be used to do that so uh, one of the uh, one of the things we did was we put this thing on a hot air balloon as a tracker because we were guaranteed to get it back and we wanted to test it all out so there's the path we ran this at the uh, Telford 50 celebration a couple of years ago and you can see that we parked the car here we walked around in the arena for a bit it spent a long time on the gondola of a hot air balloon and then it took off and it shot off over here. So uh, that provides quite a high resolution uh, GPS track of the balloon path. So what have we done? Um, we've been on the road, we've tracked a few other people's high altitude balloons with our tracking system. We've taken this on the road for a lot of STEM things. We did Telford 50 and Telford 51. We've been to the Cosford Air Show a couple of times and we've displayed it there to uh, try and get people interested. We've done TDAR's Hamfest, we've done various Linux user group uh, presentations and uh, we're here today.
uh, we put it on three different hot air balloons because uh, when we did it on the first one, they liked it so much, they asked us to come back to do it, to track their hot air balloons at a later date. And of course, we've actually flown the thing for real a few times. There we are at Cosford. This is displaying it. It's a big attraction on a giant screen for the kids to see the signals. Um, you can't see it very well, but here's the sheepdog puppy. It's on its tripod. Here's the screen. And this is the antenna. And all the reception photos and all the rest of it was going on on this bench here. There's the actual payload. There's the screen again. Uh, this was a Telford Hamfest. You can see this is the uh, website that we're receiving from the, the tracker on the balloon itself in here. There's one of the pictures the high altitude balloon took just after it had taken off. It took off down here, which was where we saw in the track. And I think that was that was a picture that got me really excited. I, I thought it was going to work when I saw that picture. So then we actually flew it. Um, there it is sitting on the ground. That's the parachute ready laid out. That's the balloon. There's the parachute. And the payload is somewhere around here. There you can see it's just come off the ground. There's the parachute. There's the first picture it took. That's a picture of the uh, Wenlock Edge and a bit of the uh, Shropshire Dales. Going up, getting into the cloud line. Above the clouds and we can see there's a second cloud layer. Going up, going up on through the second cloud layer. This is about uh, 20 kilometers up. Still going up. Still going up. That's almost the highest point. And uh, this one is the highest point. You can see we've got quite a nice black of the sky here. And you probably can't see it, but just here is a picture of the moon. But uh, yeah, so uh, I was quite pleased with that. And uh, then obviously it got it to its up absolute height and it went through the, um, the jet stream and it did a rather nice little pirouette inside the jet stream. The uh, green lines are tracks from people who were receiving it. These two were down in France. Uh, I'm not sure which one was me, probably this one. Uh, but we were basically chasing after it. And uh, this was just a screenshot from that Hab Hub tracker. So you can see we were tracking it right up to uh, about 25 kilometers up. Balloon burst and it starts coming down. It's wobbling a lot now, but it's, uh, it's coming down, approaching the cloud level. And there's a picture of it. This is London. So it went quite a long way from Shropshire to uh, the outskirts of London, Twickenham. Bit of the data, we started off atmospheric pressure at uh, 100,000, whatever that is, Pascal, whatever it is. We went up, so the pressure came down, and then we came down quite a lot faster than we'd gone up. Pressure versus altitude, that's another version of the graph that we saw right at the beginning. You can see it got pretty low pressure, about 1%, so uh, quite low. Internal temperature. While it was uh, still reasonably warm, you can see that the Raspberry Pi itself heated it. And of course, the sun was shining on it. So it got quite warm in there, 55 degrees C. Um, but it never went down below about 17 degrees C, which uh, we were very pleased when we saw that. Uh, that meant our plans to use this uh, pot bottle as a solar trap had worked quite well. That's the external temperature. As you can see, a bit of a different story. We peaked down below minus 50 centigrade. So um, yeah, we were pretty pleased that we managed to keep the internal temperature up at 20. Altitude versus time, quite a nice straight line going up. And then obviously it's coming down on a parachute. So you expect it to slow down a bit, but not an awful lot. About uh, five meters per second uh, we came down at. 
it landed in London, as we said. We were 22 kilometers away from it. This was the last uh, signals we got. And as you can see from uh, the rate of descent here, we've lost it at about 100 meters off the ground. So that's not too bad at going, really. 22 kilometers, 10 milliwatts. Um, and it was only 100 meters off the ground when we lost it in, in the London smog. There's the track from the uh, Hab Hub tracker. And we can see that as it nearly touched the ground, it did this little loop. So it was actually going in this direction when it landed. And we predicted it would have landed somewhere around here. So we went on to uh, Google Maps, had a look at that road. And I took this uh, screenshot of Google Map or Google Street Map showing this house. And uh, once we recovered it, there's the picture of it that it was taking lying on the ground in the middle of the road of that same house. So that was rather pleasing. And so it sat there for about an hour. We, as we said, we were 22 miles out and we were driving through London. So it took a little while. Eventually, a cyclist came by and it took a picture of the cycle. And uh, yeah, so uh, that worked uh, quite well. We uh, talked to the cyclist. They said, oh, we've got it. Can we have uh, give it back to you? They wouldn't accept the award, but uh, they gave it back to us. We flew the thing another time. I'll just include a couple more pictures. That's one of my favorites. There's another picture. This was um, somewhere outside Birmingham. It was coming down. There's a picture it took on the ground while we were trying to find it. Not a very good picture, but you can just see the glow of the LEDs in the bottle sitting in the middle of the field somewhere around south of Coventry, I think. We all went over the pub. There's my favorite picture. And oops, any questions? Okay, brilliant, lovely. Thank you very much, Heather. That was, uh, that was really good. Let me just um, turn your slide off so we can get everyone on the screen. Okay, everybody, uh, that was absolutely fascinating. I know I've got a number of questions, but I'm sure other people have as well. So uh, who wants to go first? David, are you waving at me? Or Russell? Sorry, let's take Ru David first and Russell. Do you want to unmute, David? David, you need to unmute. <laughs> we'll get there in a second. Found it, yeah, it's because I'm, I'm on my iPad rather than at home on the computer. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, the, I can't remember what you called it, shepherd's crook, whatever it was that you used for, for tracking the uh, balloon that was land-based on the, the tripod that, that um, had a small antenna on it and a screen system. That was the puppy, yes. The puppy? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, you get it. That looked, yeah, it was either the shepherd's crook or the sheep dip yeah. or something like that. I wasn't really <laughs> Exactly sure. so. <laughs> the um, the system you have for that is not directly re not directly related to high altitude ballooning, but that looks like a great way of organising an antenna rotator. There's a lot of people on antenna rotators. The um, the sensing component fails, so you've still got the stepper motor, so you can still turn it round, but you've no way to know which way it's pointing. Yeah. Um, do you know if anybody's come up with any modifications for that or anybody's used it for that or is that where you got it from? Um, we, we haven't made any modifications. Um, we did think about doing it. It's, um, it's a little bit difficult to calibrate to the sort of accuracy that you want for the higher frequencies. Um, I'm a HF guy, so... Okay, it would be fine for an HF antenna. Um, and yeah, it could be quite easily modified to do that. Um, the tricky part is getting the information out of the sensor. Um, obviously, if you're doing it on a, a Wi-Fi antenna, you probably don't want to be doing it on... Uh, um, sorry, if you're doing it on an a, a amateur radio antenna, you probably don't want it transmitting Wi-Fi next to the antenna. Uh, maybe. But yeah, it certainly could be. Um, one of the little projects that we did play with, I never actually finished, was I want, I've got a couple of um, windscreen wiper motors. 
and I was going to use those to drive it on top of a car so that while I was driving along, it would keep pointing in the right direction. Uh, but I never quite got that far. It's sort of a, a little bit military oriented, that idea, I think. Uh, but um, yes, yeah, certainly if, if you're driving it from a stepper motor, um, it, using a magnetometer to tell where it's pointing is a, is a good way of doing it and would work. Right. And was all the software for that all open source? It's all open source. I don't do anything that isn't. It's all available. I think it's all on the website, on my website, myorangedragon.com. But if it isn't, um, just send me an email and I'll, I'll send you anything you want. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Thanks for sharing. You are. Thank you, David. Thank you. Uh, Russell, I think you were next. Yeah, I was. Thank you, Nick. Um, thanks, Heather. Really interesting talk. Um, I'm also very impressed with your uh, books backdrop there. That's far better than most politicians uh, <laughs> I've had uh, on, on the, the television of, of late. Um, <clears throat> What sort of weight is the um, the thing that you're lifting up? Um, I, I ask this primarily because, like Dave, I'm a, an HF man, and I always have this fantasy about being able to lift a uh, one sixty meter DX antenna up with a balloon. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. uh, yes. hang on a second. I'm just scrolling back through this presentation because I can't remember the answer, but it is um, 1.3 kilograms. Okay, so that's that's fairly heavy. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and which which of those balloons that on that website were you using? Um, the uh, we, we actually used um, this one, which was a, a 1600 gram one. Okay. Um, sorry, you can't see that, can you? No, you can't. No, I can't. <laughs> sorry. But, but I can. sorry, yes, uh, by mistake. Um, it, yeah, it's a it's a, a 1600 um, gram balloon. Okay. Uh, and it used um, about one and a half bottles of helium. Okay, so that that's the one that's about 95 pounds, yeah. 62. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. Expect me on uh, 160 meter DX soon. Okay, <laughs> we'll look forward to it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Heather. Really, I mean, you know, I, I know I'm being slightly facetious about 160 meters, but that was a very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Russell. I've got John, G3PHA. <clears throat> no, good evening, uh, Heather, and uh, thanks for the, for the talk. Uh, most interesting being uh, a high altitude balloon uh, a, a listening enthusiast. I've got a couple of questions for you. One concerns the does uh, insurance cause problems uh, for you using this type of equipment as it's, it could come down anywhere? And I take it that the, the gondola, if I could call it that, the payload which is suspended from the balloon is quite a distance from the balloon and is suspended by its tether. I take it that the tether is non-metallic. Yes. Um, sorry. Yes. So the the the, uh, the tether is made of nylon. Uh, the CAA uh, who who let you fly it have a maximum allowable breaking strain, so that if a plane flies into it, um, then it will just break the uh, the cable. Um, so it's actually very thin. Uh, it, it's actually jewelry, jewelry making um, nylon that people use for uh, making these uh, wristbands and things like that. Um, so yeah, the tether, the tethers for all of these things are, are um, uh, very low breaking strain, so that they will just snap if anything runs into them. The reason I asked the question is. Uh, when I was uh, working, I was a, 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 the transmission engineer, electricity board, and on one occasion, a meteorological balloon came down, and it became entangled with the uh, one three two kV um, overhead lines. Oh, okay. And it was the it, this was on. I think they operated on uh, forty megs, and right. the the gondola was suspended by a wire, which is acted as the antenna. 
Right. The gondola was about 10 feet above the ground with the wire wrapped around the conductor. Oh, so that's not that good. Was, uh, <laughs> that, that was a little difficult uh, job to, de to deal with. But uh, it was, I was surprised actually that, um, that this was the type of construction that they, that, that they used. And that obviously being at, uh, on uh, 70 megs, 70 centimetres, um, Antennas are also very much smaller, so it'll be nothing of that size. Yeah, yeah, no, um, yes, we, we, we wanted to avoid anything like that. Um, and also, you asked about insurance. Yes. Um, we didn't insure it, uh, we did look into it. It's not easy to do. Um, the risks are actually pretty low. Um, it, the it, it, though it does weigh one and a half kilos, um, it's uh, it doesn't come down awfully hard, and it's a, a plastic pot bottle, which can compress as well because, as I said, it's made from two halves. So the risks of it doing any damage are pretty small, um, and we we did look into it. It's very difficult to get anyone to provide insurance for it. Um, so uh, in the end, we decided not to uh, to be insured. Um, and that was okay with the CAA, they didn't require it of us. Right. For all your um, high altitude balloon enthusiasts, uh, is there um, a, a central sort of group or organisation, the Numbrella organisation that uh, you're all members of? Um, not really an organisation. Uh, there is that the, the Hab Hub um, is where most people actually do stuff in terms of tracking it and uh, reporting stuff um, and there is a um, an IRC channel that's very common uh, a lot of people on it uh, associated with that and in fact you have to use that IRC channel to tell everybody you're going to do it and get it registered with the HAP Hub so uh, um, yeah that that the uh, tracker.habitat.org is a good place to go and associated bits of that website will, will give you all the information about how to get on the IRC channel. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from uh, offline um, from Ian, who's M6 ITH, who works for Yorkshire Water. So unsurprisingly, he's saying uh, to you uh, that there are a lot of uh, water reservoirs uh, around that area where the balloon came down. Did you consider that uh, the balloon might end up inside one of the reservoirs? And uh, he was also asking, and this is a question I was going to put to you, Heather, that it was very close to Heathrow Airport, and was that something else you had to consider? And my question was going to be, um, presumably you have to get a permit from the CAA to fly, and do they, they can't just allow you to, it can't be like the, um, you know, the GB uh, YDS call signs we've got for the weekend. They can't give you a permit to fly it uh, on Saturday and you can set it off whenever you like because there will be a very grave risk that some pilot suddenly sees this massive balloon in front of them and gets extremely concerned. So how is that, how is all that bit of it managed, Heather? That was, I think, the second part of uh, Ian's question there. Okay, so um, the, the CAA, yes, they... they give us a, um, a permit to fly. The um, permit says in which directions we're allowed it, it's allowed to go. So on the morning before we let go, we were consulting with the uh, prediction software to see which way it was likely to go. And of course that depends on the altitude as well. So we, had to f we have to use a flight model of it to see if it's gonna go in a direction that's okay with the, with the CAA. We actually had five different slots allowed to us, and we only managed to fly on two of those. Um, so it, it is a bit tricky from here. Uh, we have to worry about Birmingham airspace, RAF Shawbury, which is north of us here. Um, so yes, um, now the, um, the issue with Heathrow, uh, we shouldn't have gone that far. Uh, we were unusual in... Uh, our flight model predicted that the balloon would burst rather earlier than it did. So although we did have authorization and that was a valid re direction of travel, we went unusually far the first time. Uh, that was why we built the, um, that 
uh, bottle and the filling nozzle so that we could get a much better estimate of the uh, lift so that we wouldn't make that mistake a second time. Um, on the subject of reservoirs, uh, yeah, the, uh, the balloon when it lands is not buoyant. We have, it, there are holes in that bottle, um, so it will sink eventually. But if it landed in a reservoir, it, we would probably lose it. Um, the reservoirs aren't very large compared to the uh, amount of space in the country where it might have gone. But nevertheless, yeah, that, that is one of the risks. Um, unfortunately, there's not much we can do about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, right, who else has got a question to uh, to Heather? Wave at me or just unmute if I don't see you on the two screens. Yeah, Roger, G4 UFZ. Yeah, hi Heather, thanks for the talk, very interesting. Uh, I wonder, is it a very collaborative or a very competitive environment? You know, you, you talk about all the software, for example, the whole team of people and, and all that, does it... Is, Collaborative, or is it? You know, you're competing for how far and how how high, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, not really. No, um, it's it's uh, it's not competitive. Um, I think there's quite a few people do it. We we all just do it for the fun of it. Um, we uh, we uh, it is collaborative. Um, as you saw, there were quite a few people involved. Uh, Ian helping hold it. He wrote some of the software. I don't know if John Alexander is on. He's, um, I can't see him, but anyway, John Alexander, who's here today, uh, he did some uh, uh, some of the testing work and he uh, he provided some of the, the hardware. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, as a Linux users group, we did quite a bit. Uh, my partner is behind me, uh, sorry, behind you, um, <laughs> waving to me to say he helped a lot. He did all the driving and uh, a load of the, the, the mechanics of it. So. Uh, yeah, we did a lot of it together. Um, my, my role was mostly the software and uh, getting it all working because I was the one that was enthusiastic, I guess. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roger. Uh, yeah, Jim Mockley, W7JMM. Uh, yes, hi. Thank you, Heather. That was a very interesting uh, display and uh, uh, I'd like to learn more. You mentioned you had a website. Uh, could you give that out so I could Maybe yep. research this a bit. It's uh, www.myorangedragon.com. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, it's um, there's there's all all the stuff I do is on there, but uh, it's under amateur radio and then HAV high altitude. Blue. Um, and if you want anything else, uh, there there isn't a lot of detail there, uh, but just get in touch with me. Um, the, my email address is heather at myorangedragon.com. And uh, yeah, I, I, I love to talk about it as you've probably gathered. So uh, yeah, just, just ask questions and uh, next time we're flying the thing, we'll let you know and you can come along and join in. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, a right, little, little tough for me to participate. I'm across the pond, so. <laughs> ah, okay. Sorry, yes, <laughs> I should have guessed, but okay, yes, yeah. okay. Okay, thank you, Jim. I've got a question for you, Heather, uh, from uh, Keith, M0KIL. Uh, he's written, IIRC Dayton did a car-mounted Doppler DF system that was used by the police. Have you considered anything like this? Uh, wow, um, <laughs> car-mounted Doppler direction finding. Um, no, uh, what, what I, as I mentioned earlier to, uh, um, I'm not sure who was it, Brian's question. Um, the, uh, we did look at using this, um, uh, mobile with the, um, the sheepdog puppy, which, uh, would be based on a couple of motors, uh, driving the antenna around, uh, and, um, that would sort of do the same thing. As I said, the, the mechanics and the electronics and the software is quite a, advanced for that. And uh, in the end, as we found out, just a vertical on the roof does a very good job of receiving everything. So uh, we didn't go that far. But uh, yeah, these are all good, good things to think about. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe the next one we do, we'll do something similar. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Darren, G0BWB. 
Yes, uh, good evening and thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, a follow-up talk actually to one we had um, about 15, maybe 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> back in those days there certainly weren't um, the Raspberry Pis etc. And uh, the one main concern was getting the payload back. And it was basically uh, the F finding when the thing landed. As you say, you got a basic idea where it was going to land, but uh, uh, not very accurate. So I uh, just wonder how often do you lose the payload? Touch wood. We haven't lost one yet. Um, Good stuff. The, the, uh, the um, community, the, as I said, mentioned this IRC channel, um, they think it's probably about 5%. But mostly people lose them because they um, they have technical failures. So the radio fails, the battery runs out before it lands, or the balloon doesn't burst um, and it uh, it just keeps going until it, it goes over the, the ocean or something like that. Um, so uh, yeah, it's not often if it actually lands that you don't get it back, but they, they, think, they thought overall it was about 5%. Yeah, pretty good back then. I think back then it was a little bit more than that, but um... Uh, yeah, I think the other interesting thing is also all the photographs. I think that back there, that was the, the main thing people were getting out of it. Yeah. And uh, the guy who did the talk for us back then, um, his balloon went up over Emily Moore. Um, so we, we got uh, a lot of really good shots of uh, the local countryside to us and uh, pitched from above the mast, uh, yeah. which is quite uh, unusual these days. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Darren. Um, anyone else with a question to Heather? Um, yeah, Richard, G4GCX. Need to unmute, Richard. We can't hear you. Need to unmute. <laughs> yeah. The person who did the Doppler effect uh, tracking was Dave Tong. He started it all in the 70s and 80s. And I remember at rallies, he used to have four aerials on his, on his uh, display. And if you walk around with a handheld, the actual LED display used to follow you. I mean, he, only, he don't live far from us, doesn't Dave? But uh, I don't think he he sold his company because they did have uh, a lot of um, DFing using his method. And uh, when he retired, he don't really want to know now. So he's, uh, I, I don't even know if he's still got his amateur radio license. I can't remember his call sign. So the truth, but I don't know if anybody listening might. He used to run a company called Daytong, D-A-T-O-N-G. Right. That's quite impressive. Uh, direction finding for uh, um, that closely spaced antennas is, is quite a difficult thing to do. So, uh, yeah, good for him. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I think a number of us remember, remember Daytong. Uh, Terry, G3VFC. Yes, well done. Um, excellent talk, Heather. Absolutely brilliant. Had, had my nose pointing in the right direction and the eyes open. Wonderful. <laughs> um, what, uh, what, what's the um, interference problem or no problem at all from uh, the amateur usage of the band? Um, we have not had any problems um, for, for amateur use. Uh, remember that this is an ISM band. Um, the uh, we the only problems we've actually seen were when we were in testing uh, people using car fobs, which also use that that particular part of the band. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we we actually had it at one of the Linux users group events, and people were pushing their uh, car fobs outside, and we could see that. Um, but uh, once it's up at about uh, five kilometers up, I think there's no, virtually nothing coming through because it does have to be such low power, 10 milliwatts, um, which on the ground doesn't go anywhere at all. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we, haven't ha we haven't had any problems from amateurs uh, yet. Um, and uh, we're, we're very thank thankful to, to, to the amateurs because yeah. they're the ones who are tracking it for us. So uh, yeah. Yeah, very good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Right, uh, after Terry, any other people want to ask a question to Heather? Yeah, uh, Richard, um, I've got Richard, I've got Richard again and I've got Russell again. Uh, so Richard first then Russell. Yeah, there is a, a picture of his uh, DF finding equipment on the internet on RigPix. If you just put date on uh, DF finder, 
um, you can have a look at that and uh, see what you think. Okay, that sounds good. I'll uh, I'll do that. And then I've got Russell. So yes, I do remember Dayton, um, but uh, yeah, Heather, I just wondered, does your equipment ever end up in somebody's back garden or in somewhere you don't have access to? Do you have a problem with gaining access to that area? The, um, the general rule, um, uh, well, the, the simple answer is no, we haven't yet. Okay. Um, it does happen. Um, the general rule is if you can find out what, whose property it's landed on and ask them if it's okay for you to go and get it. Um, we, the, the two that we've tracked, uh, one, I say, landed in the middle of a street, so it wasn't on anyone's property and it was picked up by this cyclist. Um, the uh, other ones have all landed in fields um, and luckily they haven't been fields that have had crops in them, so we've been okay to uh, make our way through the furrows or the stubble and the last one. Cool. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, uh, we we advise people and people advise us to to find out if we can whose land it's on. Yeah. Um, the uh, well, that, that, that could I, be a problem, I guess. Finding out. It it can be yes. Um, the uh, the high uh, hot air balloon that we tracked, um, or one of the, the hot air balloons that we tracked, they actually came down in a field, um, and. Uh, when they started looking into it, it turned out that the guy who owned the field really didn't want them there. So they put some more hot air in it and went back up and landed in another field. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, I think if, you, if you're doing something the size of a, a, a hot air balloon, you do need to be a bit careful of worry, really worrying the sheep and so on. Yeah, yeah. We had a cra uh, hot air balloon crash land in the back garden here. All right. Um, it was a couple of years ago, and it was quite spectacular. Oh, dear. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. It didn't do any damage, but, yeah, they, they obviously weren't that welcome trying to get everything extricated out of the garden. You can imagine. Yes, exactly. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, we obviously we can't control where it comes down, but we uh, yeah. hopefully... Most, most but in fact, the, the, uh, the couple that collected it on their bicycle they they were really keen they wanted us to take their photo and they wouldn't take any uh, reward they they just thought it was a really cool thing to be doing and to be, fantastic yeah, be part of yeah. part of them so yeah yeah most people are quite happy with it that's great thank you thank you okay has anyone else got any uh, more questions to heather hi nick yeah jeff from belgium yes go on jeff Okay, thank you very much, Gita, for this very nice talk, an interesting talk. I, I'm really surprised by the pictures, how nice they are and how sharp they are. Um, just a question about this, do you send them live to, to your station back or is that on, uh, on, on an SD card or something? How do you handle that to get it, that back? It, and it's then, on an, yeah, it's on an SD card. Okay. Um, we, we did do a little bit of sending thumbnails. Those are eight megapixel pictures. So we only get them if we get the payload back. Okay. Um, but uh, we did try sending, you can send pictures by um, SSTV. Okay. And uh, we, we looked into it. Um, I tried doing it on the low bar, but really to send that amount of data takes so long that um, you'll only get two or three pictures um, from it and the reliability of getting all the data um, isn't really worth the investment. Um, now that said, David Ackerman has written a system where um, it'll send different packets okay. and you can then relay them all back to another central server which will put all the packets together and eventually build up the whole picture. Uh, we haven't used that, but that is another way of doing it. But uh, for the number of pictures we wanted to take, we took a picture every two minutes on our flights. Um, and the, uh, the number of pictures and the amount of data, we just couldn't have sent it down. Uh, which okay. did lead to one thing. My, my intentions for the future 
is I'm going to put one of these 5.6 gig drone cameras on and try sending data from, uh, from that. It won't last very long because they're very battery hungry, but uh, we could at least get a, maybe 20 minutes of uh, flight time uh, from a 5.6 gig uh, drone, which also works in another ISM band. So uh, we obviously allowed to fly drones uh, in the air. Okay, Gita, thank you very much. And I, I, I can say I already received such a balloons from, uh, from UK. Uh, the the best catch I ever got was a balloon, I think, from one of the university students from the university who did some experiments. And I got them at 400 kilometers from here. They were at the south of, of Paris. So with 10 milliwatts, I could decode the RTTY on 70 centimeters with the, with the FL Digi program, not the special program that you are using, but just with the simple oh. RTTY FL Digi program. It was very easy, actually. So everyone can do it with sample antennas and a sample receiver. Um, another thing here in, in, in the Netherlands, there is a yearly event in September where they launch a balloon with a, uh, it's a fox hunting exercise actually. And they're hunting a balloon with a crossband repeater, uh, 70 centimeters, two meters, and with an ATV repeater on it. Mm -hmm. And so all the amateurs, and well, a lot of amateurs in, in the UK, sorry, in the Netherlands and in Germany and in Belgium are hunting and listening for this uh, balloon. Sometimes this balloon drops down in, 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 in Germany or so. So the people are just hunting with the cars and, you know, are hunting this, um, this uh, balloon. It's every year in the month of September. Um, and sometimes they also get reception reports from the UK. So uh, this is something which is really fascinating. I don't know with the COVID how this will happen this year. There will be a different story. But anyway, maybe could be something to look uh, out for. Thank you very much, Hunter. Yeah. I hope to see, hope to hear you more from you. Thank you very much, Jeff. That's really interesting. We, we, uh, yeah, we, we could do something like that. I, I think that. Now we're allowed to travel in the UK with the COVID thing. Uh, that, that might be something we could consider uh, doing. Yeah, I like that idea. Um, yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that, Jeff. Um, right, any other questions to or comments from to Heather? No one, yeah, I've got John G through PHA. Uh, hi, Heather again. Um, okay. In view of what's uh, transpired, in the question and answer session. Um, is there a need, do you think, for an emergency device uh, attached to the balloon in case you get into sort of some kind of serious difficulty a lot? Um, I'm not quite sure what, how, what, what you mean by there. I mean, how would it get into difficulties? Well, if it's going into uh, sort of a, a military site, or over a military site, um, and in an area where there's a lot of aeronautical activity that's going, it's, it's not been planned for, and you think, well, we're better abort at the attempt rather than waiting for the balloon itself to burst. Right. Um, some people have done it. Um, I did actually design a little thing. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, balloon is attached to the payload through a nylon cord. So if we just wrap a little bit of fuse wire around it, and then we could put uh, all the batteries through that fuse wire and melt the nylon cord, and then the, the payload would just drop off. Um, yeah, it could be done. It could be done quite easily uh, if we had a way of communicating with the balloon um, reliably to tell it to do that. Uh, we haven't developed that yet, although as I did mention, I think briefly, the uh, we can talk to the LoRa from the uh, the Wi-Fi gateway. Um, so uh, yeah, that's something we could do. Uh, as I said, the, the CAA do try and make sure that you're not going to go anywhere bad. Uh, but uh, do things do go wrong, as you heard, with um, going a little bit near Heathrow? Yeah, but if you're at to sort of 20,000 feet or so, um, you, you, you can't control the thing. You, you're at the mercy of, of nature and the weather, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, yes, um, we, we do quite extensive um, planning. Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of uh, flight path analysis tools. So that 
So there's a reasonable guess about where it's going to go if you've got your maths right. Um, and oh yeah, that yeah, my partner's just muttering over here. Um, it it goes to 25 kilometers, so about 70,000 feet. It goes through the uh, aircraft flight paths very very quickly. It's only there for literally minutes. Um, so the chances of interfering with anything uh, that's likely to be a problem are quite slim. Uh, but uh, yeah, we could we could build a, a an auto detach system in there. Um, we haven't done so yet, but it could be done. Thank you. Uh, there's a question on the chat uh, for you, Heather, from Julian G7FQE, and he was just pointing to a video board. Um, add-on for a Raspberry Pi and wondered if you consider uh, putting a video transmitter into the payload. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we could do. As, as I said, I, I have mentioned uh, well, we, we have talked quite seriously and got some designs together for a, uh, um, a drone FPV system. Uh, I don't know what, I just have a quick look at this one. Uh, yeah, this is this is quite reasonable. It's not extremely high resolution, but uh, yeah, it could be done. It could be done. Um, what sort so, of uh, yeah, I, I think it would... bandwidth do you have? Um, Sorry, the the download bandwidth for the uh, for the low RAR is is low. It, it wouldn't be anything like this capable of video. Mm -hmm. uh, but a five point six drone system, um, we we run. Um, certainly VGA and probably higher in uh, 25 frames a second video. So uh, we've, we've easily be able to do it if we did that sort of system. Um, whether the 5.6 gig would go far enough? Well, I don't know. I, I On doing terrestrial 5.6 gig, we've done TV over 120 kilometers with no problem at all. So 25 kilometers line of sight should be quite easy. Okay, lovely, thank you. Right, any other questions to Heather? Don't want to cut anyone out who's got uh, anything they want to put. If not, um, I would like to uh, take the opportunity of thanking Heather very much for a really interesting um, introduction to, uh, to all of us, I think, on high altitude balloons and uh, having a bit of fun with them. Uh, I'm sure I can see a few people with a few cogs whirring in people's heads there about whether they want to explore this a bit further. So uh, uh, that's always great, Heather. So can we first of all just show our appreciation in a normal way to Heather for her contribution tonight? She was really good. And, uh, and Heather, just to say before you disappear, that, that was really interesting. We, we all enjoyed it and uh, uh, we, we look forward to uh, hearing you at, uh, at future events uh, giving presentations. I know that uh, we've got you down to speak. I'm going to do another plug for it, guys. <laughs> I'm, we've got you down to speak at the GQRP Club convention on the weekend of the 5th and 6th of September. And uh, you're going to give... Uh, a reasonably short presentation in a slot uh, on antenna an analyzers uh, to the GQRP club convention. So uh, uh, anyone here who's attending that uh, will get an opportunity to hear you on a completely different subject. So thank you very, thank you very much, Heather. And um, I'll uh, 